Good evening. I'm Jay DeLeon. I'm the Director of Engagement here at NYU Skirball. Welcome to the first Skirball Talk of the semester. Uh, we will be back again in three weeks with Tara Westover, and our November talks will be announced shortly, so keep an eye on our website, check back for updates. Uh, tonight, it's my pleasure to welcome Zhidong Zheng, Professor of Comparative Literature and Chinese, and Director of the International Center for Critical Theory at NYU. Uh, welcome to the Skirball event uh, this evening. Uh, it's my honor and a privilege to welcome Slava Zhitek uh, to NYU. I will be very, very brief. Uh, Zizek needs no introduction, but I, I guess it's my duty to read uh, just a little bit from the description. Uh, Slava Zizek is a senior researcher at the Institute of Sociology, University of Ljubljana, uh, Slovenia, and a visiting professor at a number of American universities, Columbia, Princeton, New School, and NYU, of course. And uh, you see the list of his books. Uh, and here I will be creative but by adding two personal points. One is I'm always surprised to see the absence of the one big book that I love that is less than nothing. That's a 1,000 uh, page book on Hegel. And I would uh, urge you to add this book to the list. The other is a more sort of personal note. Uh, on my first meeting with Slavoj when I was still a graduate student at Duke University. And uh, I should say this, for the past three decades, uh, he has been a, an integral part of the very intellectual and the theoretical frame by which and through which we uh, tackle with the, uh, the problems, the challenges, the crises uh, in front of us. So it's uh, really, my pleasure to uh, introduce him tonight, and please join me uh, to welcome Slava. Thank you very much. I'm glad to be here again, I think for the first or fourth time. I don't want to disappoint you, so let me make it clear, I will of course not stick to the title Disorder Under Heaven, or it will be just a very specific disorder. I will be talking about the gender relations, disorder, and a little bit connected with the topic of ecology. Now, I will begin with what, as some of you may know, brought me so much trouble and I don't care to think deeper into it, uh, some critical remarks on LGBT plus and so on. Although partisans of LGBT plus like to dismiss psychoanalysis as out of date, many of them, I think, fully participate in the ongoing repression of basic Freudian insights. Are you aware how much of Freud is simply repressed. Maybe we could use this term today. Let, let, let me name one topic, infantile sexuality. In our obsession with priests and others molesting small children, the very idea that what is children in themselves are not so innocent is unmentionable. So if psychoanalysis taught us anything, it is that Human sexuality is immanently perverted, traversed by sadomasochist spins and power games. It is that in it, in sexuality, pleasure is inextricably interlinked with pain. What we get in many LGBT plus ideologies is the opposite of this insight. The naive view that if sexuality is not distorted by patriarchal, binary, and so on pressure, it becomes a happy space of authentic expression of our true self. It is crucial to note how, in all their efforts to historicize gender identities and to render visible their constructed nature, at least the LGBT plus theories that I know accept the fact of gender identities 
the way they operate in our everyday ideology. Often, I, my impression is that they are just against the idea that there are two main gender identities, masculine and feminine. They simply want to enlarge the numbers. There are 30, 31, 32 identities, and so on and so on. What I miss there is to, as it were, explode, problematize from within the very notion of gender identity. I don't have time to go in this direction today. Let me just give you a hint. The beginning of a dialogue with LGBT plus would have been to problematize, I often deploy this idea, some of you maybe know it, the notion of plus. What does it mean, LGBT plus? Usually this plus is taken in a, sorry for this term, British empiricist way. We have many identities by uh, uh, trigender, uh, asexual, beat, whatever you want, book, and so on. But how do we know that we are open enough? What if somebody comes and says, sorry, I don't recognize myself in your list. So plus means and all the others. Here, for me, already problems begin. I think that if we can learn something from the best of psychoanalysis and philosophy, is that you can directly be a plus as such. This is human subjectivity. And that's what in psychoanalysis we call hysteria. Hysteria is the fundamental form of critique of ideology. The hysterical question is, you, husband, master, society, you are telling me I am that, your wife, your pupil, your servant, but why am I what you are saying that I am? Is this permanent questioning of my own uh, position? This is why, please do not misunderstand my critical remarks on LGBT+. Plus. I immensely uh, respect them. I think that an authentic LGBT uh, transgender subject is the closest we can get to something that I shamelessly call uh, 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 authentic, ethical, subjective sense. So, what should we do to get at this point? Uh, it is crucial to note how, in their effort to historicize gender identities and render visible their constructed nature, the LGBT ideologies, are, as far as I know, maybe I'm wrong, I'm trying to follow what goes on there, uh, uh, ignore a little bit too much the fact which, again, I don't perceive it as a negative fact, but it's crucial to understand this, philosophically, ethically, and politically, of what I cannot but designate as what falsely appears as a centralist language. I met many people who change their sexual identity, mostly from masculine to feminine, although, of course, there are also changes in other directions. And I was so surprised how, almost with all of them, the language they used to account for their experience was uh, what, in uh, deconstructionalist jargon that I don't care, they called essentialism, essentialist language. For example, people repeatedly tell me, of this liberating effort, like a boy who became a girl told me, finally I have a body into which I should have been born. Now, are you aware how this runs against the usual deconstructive transgender ideology, which is, I say this with all my respect for her, personal respect, uh, Judith Butlerian, uh, 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 historicism. We don't have any essential fixed identities. Every gender identity is the result of, uh, of 
performative uh, practices. We reconstruct them, we playfully, uh, 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 playfully change them all the time, and so on and so on. And I love this paradox. All of a sudden, we get, at least in what they say, and I don't care how they justify it afterwards. That, that's what they say. This shameless use of essentialist language. It is as if, that's how they talk, it is as if I somewhere existed, at least in a purely virtual way, before I was born with a fixed identity, and it happened from time to time that then I was born into a wrong body. Finally, through the transgender operation, I can find my own proper body. Now you will say, this is a fiction. Of course it's a fiction, but it's, if I may put it like this, a truthful fiction. I am an atheist. I don't believe we have an eternal nature which includes a, a sexual identity before we were born. What I'm only saying is that in our sexual, symbolic, and so on practice, the way we act, we act as if we have such an a priori identity. That, and that, this paradox of how our practice retroactively presupposes or posits such an essence which doesn't exist in itself is the act of freedom, what Hegel calls self positive. For example, my other hero is, I like this news. Uh, was the big other who intervened now. Uh, uh, you know, recently I read, I like this crazy news, in, uh, uh, in newspapers that a guy in India, Robert something, I forgot his name, but he's an Indian, uh, is prosecuting his parents, put them to court. Why? Claiming they gave birth to him without asking him for a permission. In some sense, he is right. We don't have an, in, in this, this close look, it's a fiction, but it's not simply an ideological fiction. This self, you know why it's not? I don't have a time to go into it. Uh, it's simply a fiction. Because it is a fiction only if you presuppose that there is a full texture of fully determined reality. But the moment you accept that there are cracks in reality, that reality is in itself incomplete, then such retroactive looks where an ethic retroactively posits its cause, such looks are possible. So, what I'm saying is that, let me give you another example. Let's say something is not fashionable to talk about today, passionate love. It's the same essential category. Of course, it's contingent always, whom you fall in love into. But once you fall in love, it's essential. What do I mean by this? You, you never really choose this. You don't decide, now I will fall in love. You just live your stupid daily life. Maybe you have a one-night stand here and there. You drink, whatever. Then all of a sudden, the catastrophe happens. You, you don't fall in love. That's crucial. You realize that you are already in love. This is what I'm talking about. And the great German idealist Schelling knew this perfectly. When he realized, when he wrote that the true free decisions that constitute us are unconscious decisions. They never happen in the present. Like, all of a sudden, I knew that I had decided. And I claim the choice of our sexual identity is something like, is, uh, is, uh, something like that. And so, again, for me, to really think our gender identity, how they are, I will not go now into the distinction between truth between sex and gender, of course, uh, we need to think these two aspects together. Uh, a true materialist that is not just a cheap historicist, who say everything is historical and so on and so on. 
one has to add something. I don't have time to go into it. If you want to go into it, read my last book and so forth. It's that uh, uh, eternity itself is historical. True anti essentialism means that there are eternal essences, essences uh, but they emerge at a certain historical point and retroactively they retroactively they become eternal. Am I talking here the language of theology? Yes, proudly. Because I think that theology reinterpreted in a materialist way is an essential tool to read our predicament. Today, most actual predicament. What do I mean by this? Let me go in even into more, more uh, obscure and problematic waters. Recently, I was rereading Thomas Aquinas, his Summa Theologica, masterpiece of medieval theology, uh, where Aquinas approaches a beautiful question. I like that it's presumed by Catholic theology that in paradise you will be almost not omnipotent, but you will know everything. There will be except nature of God, no secret. So, will you be allowed in paradise to see the suffering of those in hell? And uh, Aquinas answer is yes. But then he immediately confronts a problem. If yes, then how to unite this with the fact that by definition in paradise you will be happy all the time? How can you enjoy seeing the suffering of others? Uh, Aquinas proposes a stupid, I think, invalid answer. His answer is that you, what will make you happy is not the suffering, but to witness the majesty of divine, divine justice. I think that Aquinas is speaking here. In what sense? It's in what sense is it needed for you when you enjoy heaven to see the suffering of those in hell. Let me play a game with you and let's imagine we are in heaven. Let's face it, from what we know in all the script from all the scriptures, it's a very boring place. You have all the nectar, meadows, especially it must be terribly boring. So the way I imagine it is that after some years there you became a restless, you know, is this the real life and so on. And then, like, some angels who take care of you began to worry and say, are you not satisfied here? Okay, let's take a look at what's down there in hell. So you take a look at that and, okay, okay, it's better here and so on. Uh, that, that's the function of it. But, uh, so, uh, my first point here is that this logic that to enjoy your happiness, you need to uh, look at self of those who are not as happy as they claim you are, those in power. Don't we live in exactly the same predicament? Our view into hell are the TV news where the war on you. Some things here may, may be unsuitable for you, children starving in Somalia, uh, war in Syria, and so on and so on. It is as if we need those horrors in the news just to become aware of how happy we should be staying where we are. But so what's my view of this? Ah, you may be here shocked. My view is this one. What if we turn around the perspective and claim that my private dream, that uh, maybe we got the wrong idea of hell. Maybe all the oil is there burning for barbecues, you drink, you have orgies, you are happy, and so on and so on. So my idea of hell is it's quite a nice place. And then once a week, a devil's manager comes to you and says, listen, guys, we all know we have a good time here. But now, for a quarter of an hour, we will be observed from heaven. So please pretend that you suffer horribly and so on and so on. And now then, after a quarter of an hour, it's, okay, CNN cameras are off. You can enjoy it again. Now you think I'm kidding here. 
I am not. I think that keep happiness and true creative, not even pleasure, this is not pleasure, this is full enjoyment, are incompatible. Let me return to my example that I gave you of love or artistic creativity and so on. It gives you nightmares. It doesn't make you happy. Again, to return to my example ten minutes ago. Imagine living a peaceful life, maybe one night stand here and there, you meet friends, drink, and then you passionately fall in love. Your peace is ruined. It's hell. But nonetheless, I would never explain this hell for heaven. It's the same with artistic uh, creativity and so on and so on. But back to my main point, why do we need this view of uh, hell? And how it functions as today's ideology. Now, I will say something more which may really hurt you, some of you. That's why I don't like uh, Margaret Atwood and myself. And especially the TV version, the TV series. I think it's the best example of what my good friend Fred Jameson calls nostalgia for the present. It's a uh, it paints with great pleasure. That's my first. Uh, you, you know, all my friends, feminine also, when I asked them, do you follow the TV series? They admitted to me that what really attracts them is the new ways how they screw, how they torture women there and so on. The new tricks, Republic of Gilead. But of course it's wonderful because it's legitimized. I watch it to see the horror of uh, fundamentalist rule and so on. You are allowed to enjoy it fully. But the main point where I don't agree with this is that we are not yet there in Gila. So what the series never does and the novel is, is the series and the novel are one big nostalgia for the society liberal permissive in which we are. It's literally our view into hell to be glad in what nice society, nonetheless, we still live. The series, the novel, never asks the simple question. But how come that this, our liberal society, gave birth to Gila? Or to apply this to your predicament? That's my problem with just criticizing Donald Trump. Yes, he is a nightmare, and so on. But how come that he succeeded in disturbing the liberal consensus? To get really rid of Trump, ask this question, what was wrong with our liberal consensus? That's why, again, I think that stories like, uh, stories like, uh, stories like Handmaid's Tale, they, they're, they're just here to make us feel good about liberal permissive and so on society. They don't ask the key question. Which is again what what wrong with what is wrong with this society? How was something like Donald Trump possible? Or to make, go a step further. You know Freudian notion of fetish, naive one. The last thing you see before you, as a small boy, notice that uh, the girl doesn't have a penis, blah, blah, blah. Okay, let's give it a more accurate version. Fetish in politics is the last thing you see before you see social antagonism. This is why, for example, the Jew, the figure of the Jew in anti-Semitism is a fetish. It's the last thing you see before you see class struggle antagonism. Jew is an erzat for class struggle. It's the element which from outside introduces antagonism into our uh, society. I think that there is something similar for that I see in liberal critics of Donald Trump. He is their fetish. The last thing they see before they would have to admit social antagonism in the United States and how Trump exploited them. Let me go on now to my main line, which is what does this mean for sexual difference, or rather, what type of femininity can we imagine today which would really counteract the still 
predominante. Uh, I wouldn't say patriarchal masculine mode of subjectivity. Uh, I claim we confront here great ideological threats, but I would like to focus on one person which is much maligned today, but I feel, in spite of all the publicity that surrounds her, admire her, is, of course, Greta Thunberg. Why do I like her? She is autistic. Uh, 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 and I think that's her strength. That's what we need today. She is not the usual figure of femininity, dialogic, open to compromise, and so on and so on. Uh, 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 no, if anything, that's now my provocation, she is an example of how the American Psychological Psychiatric sorry, Association describes toxic masculinity. I quote the definition. I quote here. A trait of so-called traditional masculinity, like suppressing emotions and masking distress, often start early in life and have been linked to less willingness by boys and men to seek help, more risk-taking and aggression, possibly harming themselves and those with whom they interact. End of quote. So I think all these features supposed to characterize toxic masculinity, suppressing emotions, masking distress, unwillingness to seek help, propensity to take risks, and so on and so on. My claim is first that there is nothing masculine about this. There are simply situations where you have to act like this. My supreme example from tradition of this type of toxic masculinity is Antigone from Sophocles' play. His man is the traditional woman, compliant, compromised, blah, blah. No, Antigone is toxically masculine. She doesn't debate, she just insists on her own. No matter what catastrophic consequences this will, uh, 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 this will uh, imply. And the same goes for uh, the same goes for uh, for uh, Greta Thunberg. Let me elaborate this a little bit more. Why this attack on toxic masculinity? Of course, to avoid a misunderstanding, I am totally opposed to any form of male violence and so on and so on. But I think I think it's not as innocent as it may appear to call this toxic masculinity, which is a medical term. Are we aware that we are doing the same as more than half a century ago? They, did, uh, they, they were doing it many, uh, in many countries, like they did to Alan Turing. You remember, the guy, my God, who almost was the crucial guy breaking the Enigma code, saving us from Nazi rule. Then he was castrated, committed suicide, and so on and so on. What toxic, what at that point they did to homosexuality with toxic masculinity, they are doing something similar. What male violence, brutality, what is a political, ideological phenomenon we medicalize it? No, this is not a medical phenomenon, male violence, and so on and so on. Uh, uh, second thing. Uh, Something is happening in our society which I find a little bit suspicious. Namely, uh, 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 there is a new, let's call it, conformist spirit where co conflict is aggress aggressivity, conflict, and so on is considered problematic. The idea is negotiations, dialogue, and so on and so on. And here, the ruling ideology constructs a specific role for women. Uh, my good friend, Alain Badiou, described to me how, because his adopted son had some legal problems and he witnessed it, how often in modern, especially to deal with juvenile uh, 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 delinquents, you need a woman as a judge, even as a policeman, and so on and so on. Women are needed today to act as representatives of the new mode of 
power, which is no longer the brutal directly oppressive power, but the more understanding power, the power which wants to help you, to re-educate you, and so on and so on. So, again, I think that this critique of toxic masculinity is part of a ideological transformation which I'm very suspicious of. I think that what we should do is to precisely see what positive aspect is obliterated by this critique of toxic masculinity. I see this again in the figure of Greta Thunberg. Let me explain what I mean by this. Greta, if you follow the news, this changed quite a lot in the last year. She changed from the naive, innocent girl saying that the emperor is naked to a smiling, aggressive, sharp tongued demon almost. But her message remains the same, simple and repeated. One should recall here Kierkegaard's wonderful short text on the difference between genius and apostle, where Kierkegaard defines genius as an individual who is able to express or articulate his inner world, what is in him more than himself, his spiritual substance, in contrast to the apostle who in himself does not matter at all. The apostle is a purely formal function of the one who dedicated his or her life to bearing witness to an impersonal truth. And I think that Greta, the way she acts, is an apostle, an apostle of truth. She does not bring forward some ingenious new insight. She just repeats the same simple message again and again. Talking about politicians, she says, we have not taken to the street for them to take selfies with us and tell us that they really, really admire what we do. We children are doing this to wake the adults up, and so on and so on. What Greta calls us to listen to is science, to take science seriously. But this does not mean that science also provides the political answer to what we are to do. Science just enables us to discern the contours of the deadlock in which we are, the catastrophic ecological implications of our economic development, and so on and so on. But there is no scientific policy. So I think, again, when Greta says, listen to science, she doesn't mean scientific policy. This will give us answer. She doesn't only mean science will tell us where the problems are. So, where are the problems? We often hear that in order to confront appropriately the threat of an ecological catastrophe, we have to renounce anthropocentrism and to conceive of ourselves, humanity, as a subordinated element in the great chain of being. We are just one species on our planet, but through our ruthless exploitation of its resources, we, humanity, are posing a threat to our Mother Earth. And Mother Earth is punishing us through global warming and other ecological threats. I think that one cannot but laugh at this vision. Not Earth. We are in trouble. Earth is indifferent. The Earth survives much worse disaster than the possible self-destruction of one of its species. Can we even imagine what catastrophes took place on Earth so that we have the energy today? Oil, uh, coal, and so on and so on. No, Earth doesn't care. What is under threat is our environment, our habitat, the only one in which we can live. From the imagined standpoint of Earth, it would have been much better for its global ecosystem if we humanity disappeared. So what is under threat in ecological crisis is our survival. Again, I find this critique of anthropocentrism for this reason totally hypocritical. They don't really care about Earth. They care about Earth which should remain 
fact that we, humanity, will be able to survive. Earth is indifferent here. Uh, what we are after is an environment that would defeat our survival. This is also why the true stakes of ecology are socio-political. Ecology is not about caring for nature. It is about a social reorganization that would maximize the conditions of our well-being. Uh, now, to conclude, uh, I would like to say that uh, what we can learn from Greta is the amount of ideology in our dealing with ecological topic. I see at least five strategies of to how we obfuscate the true dimension of our ecological crisis. First is simple ignorance. That's more or less the Donald Trump attitude. It's a marginal phenomenon. Nature will take care of itself. Don't worry. The second option is, of course, ideological option is leave the solution to the market, higher taxation of the polluters, and so on and so on. Then uh, 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 there are further options. There is the scientific option, of course, like science will find new ways to resolve ecological pressures, and so on and so on. Then, but the last two, I think, the most suspicious version. One is this, uh, how should I call it, uh, 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 the, the paradigm of Mother Earth and how we, humanity, were too arrogant, we disturbed a natural balance, so we should renounce our hubris, accept our modest place in natural hierarchy, and so on, and so on. This, I think, is the most dangerous version. Why? Because there is no natural order, there is no natural hierarchy. I cannot imagine anything more destructive than nature itself, which destroys its own ecosystem all the time. And the last version, the most dangerous, predominant even today of ecology, is of ecology ecological ideology is the strategy of personal responsibility. How does, let's call it, the power edifice address us? By power edifice, I mean simply our ideology in which we live. When you raise the problem of criticizing the state, our industry, and so on, the predominant answer is Okay, don't just criticize. What did, did you do all you can not to pollute nature? Did you do your duty? Did you put all Coke cans in a separate bag? Did you recycle all newspapers and so on and so on? This is ideology at its purest, I claim. Because it blocks radical social critique, it makes you personal response, personally responsible, but Nothing against it. Of course, we are responsible, but at the same time, it offers you an easy way out. You uh, no, recycle and shut up, and everything will be okay. My ideal here, I'm sorry, I use this story often, is the way they were years ago. They are no longer like that. Is uh, my ideal here is Starbucks. You remember years ago? They're, now they're no longer doing it to that extent. Whenever I enter a Starbucks coffee place, if you got a big poster saying something like 5% of our, uh, of our coffee goes to Guatemala children, goes to, say, some Amazon forest, and so on and so on. It's a wonderful formula because the way to what they are telling you is be consumerist, but consume us because the social price is already included into it. So, the, if you consume our products, you already do your duty towards environment and so on and so on. And I claim that that uh, uh, that we are here subtly manipulated in a very refined sense. In the sense that when we, as a rule, when we act as ecologically conscious, 
Are we aware that we are, to an important part, I think even mostly, acting not to really do something about it, but to make us feel well that we are doing something about it? My own cynical example. Why are you buying those rotten organic apples, even if they cost two times the good chemical uh, polluted apples, whatever? It's not. I spoke with many people who bought them, and they admitted to me they don't really believe that organic apples are really much better. But it makes you feel better. You see, I'm, do, I'm doing something for Mother Nature. I show solidarity, and so on and so on. This is where we find today's ideology, ideology of everyday life. Now, to make an even more pessimistic conclusion. Now, you will say, okay, we should become aware of the ecological problem and act. Okay, act and do what? Do we even know what to do? I mean, I know that scientists are today playing with different versions like spraying the air with some chemical elements which will prevent uh, the, all those dangerous things in uh, sun rays to feed the earth and so on. But everybody knows how risky these things are. We, we don't, there, how do this? We don't have a simple answer and especially, now I will say for a leftist like me, something horrible. That's why I oppose populism, even if it's especially if it's a leftist populism. I, if we can learn something from recent debate when populism became popular, as it were, is that, uh, is that Yes, people do have their own complaints and so on and so on, worries, but the worst possible political problem, political prog program is forget about this ideology, left, right, listen to ordinary people, listen to their problems, give them what they want and so on and so on. Maybe we, ideolo we theorists don't know, but ordinary people also don't know. Did you? I don't believe that. I'm not a Maoist here. You know, this old Maoist idea, go to ordinary people, learn from them, and so on and so on. Well, in most of Europe, if you go to ordinary people, they will tell you something like throw the immigrants out and so on and so on. And people tell me, yes, because the ordinary people are, are manipulated. Yes, but. We leave manipulation, ideology. This is ideology in, in which we are. And that's why I claim, uh, that's why uh, one should not be afraid to be radical here. I'm not an anti-democrat. I'm just saying that solutions, especially in today's complex situation, Solutions are not simple and clear. Like, for example, I had recently in London a debate with some partisans who still believe in uh, Venezuela's tradismo. And I told them, okay, I know, American boycott and so on and so on. But isn't it obvious that nonetheless, even if you take into account all the effects of American intervention and so on and so on, but nonetheless, to cut a long story short, Chavez did not propose a new viable model. Chavez was, for me, Fidel Castro with money. For some time it worked when the regime had enough money and so on. So, uh, we, that's the first honest thing to admit, as far as I'm concerned, that we are in a serious deadlock and that it's not just that we don't get solutions because uh, uh, some ecologists are bribed by big companies and so on and so on, whatever. What happens today with Earth is extremely dangerous, but precisely because it's self is inconsistent, it's not clear what is happening. For example, the example that I like to use all the time. 
When I was young, in Europe there was a big slogan, very popular, Waldsterben, forests are dying. And there were exact scientific calculations. In 50 years, they said, which means today this was 1970, in 40, 50 years, Europe will be without forests. I'm sad to tell you today there are more forests in Europe than ever in the last hundred years. Does this mean that there is no ecological crisis? No, but it means that the process is much more tricky, self, uh, self-contradicting, and so on and so on. The answers are not clear. The only thing clear is that, and here Greta Thunberg is right, we need science not to provide solutions. We need science to identify problems, to see, to see what the, to see what the problem. And this, I think, brings us back to our uh, starting point. We need more than ever today what I would have called in good old Marxist terms, critique of ideology. Not only with our enemies, it's ridiculously evident that, for example, in what sense what Donald Trump and these guys are doing is ideology. But uh, I think a true leftist could also do the opposite today. To ask when even liberal democratic critics of Trump are too limited to fall into the same trap. So to conclude, let me just give you one example. I mean, Trump is for me, let's avoid a misunderstanding, like a guy without a moral compass, uh, uh, kind of a immature guy, and so not necessarily to lose work on that. But you know what? What 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 disturbs me deeply in the way this impeachment of Trump is now gaining momentum. It's easy to criticize Trump, he should be criticized, because we are obviously dealing with a single corrupted individual pursuing his own interest. And Edward Snowden, whom I greatly appreciate, pointed this out. He said it's easy to criticize representatives of evil where you find clear motivation. This is an uh, egotist, crazy guy, blah, blah, blah. What I find much more dangerous is to locate the evil with evil. Okay, violations of human rights and so on, which is inscribed into the very functioning of the system. So that you can get individuals who are, in some sense, very faithful, patriotic, you absolutely cannot uh, cannot identify any uh, egotist uh, motives in them and so on, but they are doing the same thing. Uh, uh, I remember, this was my reproach to an old film which got an Oscar, I think, everybody loves it, maybe you remember it, that then there are lies of the others, the German one, anti-communist. I was opposed to that film, not because he was too tough on communism, but because it was not tough enough. You know, the story, uh, uh, an evil, it, it takes place in East Germany, an evil minister, to cut a long story short, wants to screw a beautiful wife of a playwright, and he orders the police to, 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 fo- uh, to, to cover uh, to, uh, the, the writer, to find some incrimination so that the writer could be set up and so on and so on. But, you know, the, the presupposition is still that you need an evil individual who pursues his, her, their uh, evil private goal to find evil. What about the evil inscribed into the system itself? The most dangerous thing for me are not simple egotists who do evil for obvious reasons. It is evil inscribed into the institutional function. For example, what terrifies me, to take the opposite example, in histories of Stalinism, is when they were doing, in, at the end of 1920s, enforced collectivization. They were doing horrible things. But many of them were 
honest individuals dedicated to go communist thought, who, who thought uh, to the communist uh, ideal, who thought, oh my God, okay, this has to be done, it's horrible, but it's my fidelity to a higher cause, and so on and so on. You know, I want to finish with a quote from the scientist, a quantum cosmologist, given by Weinberg, I think. He said somewhere that if without religion, good people would be doing good things and bad people would be doing bad things. You need something like religion to get good people do bad things. And that's where true ideology begins. For me, let me tell you something horrible. Although the guy who published that book against Trump, uh, the ex-FBI boss, James Comey, I think, the uh, uh, higher loyalty, you know, probably he is personally honest, I don't know. I'm just saying that this type of honesty in no way prevents horrible things taking place. So that's, that's the first thing that we should drop. The second thing is, uh, again, don't focus on private vices, on inner stories, and so on and so on. The most disgusting wisdom that I know is the one which even some partisans of multiculturalism use, which is uh, something like uh, an enemy is somebody to whose story we were not ready to listen, something like that. My reaction is, oh, then, so Hitler was our enemy because we were not ready to listen to his story or whatever. My point is not that if you listen to Hitler, you saw that he is really evil and so on and so on. My point is that the true ethical dimension is not is in what you do externally, not in the story you are telling yourself to do. That's why it fascinates me the extent to which all horrors, there is my, this is my formula, there is no ethnic cleansing without poetry. I'm systematically looking not only my own ex countries, Bosnia, I'm from Slovenia, but ex Yugoslavia and so on. I look at whatever you want uh, uh, in Rwanda and so on, every ethnic cleansing, there is usually some poet, religious leader, some myth maker who provided a story. People, colonels, are very rarely simply evil. They need a strong myth. So I don't believe in this stupidity of let's see what he's doing, but maybe we don't understand what he's doing. Let's look insight into his story. No, stories we are telling ourselves our life, covering up what we are doing. The truth is what we are doing in social interaction, not the inner story. So, at this level, we should be active today. Sorry if I was a little bit too long and confused, but that's life. Thank you very much. I was struck by your comment about lives of others. You were saying that it was too weak a criticism to focus on the evil yeah. communist party boss. But what I found most frightening about the film was that I found myself identifying with that communist party boss because the film had shown how daily life in that system was so corrupting. And so I was imagining if I had been sort of a beautiful party member, I would have tried to rise to the top. And that the actions and compromises that I was making each day would have just wiped out all of my principles. And by the time I got to the top, I wouldn't have any principles. And then I would feel like, well, I deserve something. Um, so why not take that beautiful actress? And, it, it sort of like, and, and I wouldn't have any moral values to guide me to do anything else. And so I was feeling that it wasn't very specifically showing the system where just getting to the top would strip you of all your values and then you would be reduced to that. Okay, uh, can I quickly, and then maybe you should stay there and you will reply to my reply, because my point to refer to the film was even this one. You know, my point is that if there would not have been guys like that corrupted minister, if all Stasi would have been just like that, the guy who has to follow and observe the writer, 
the guys who at the end even sat on his side, the relatively honest Stasi agent. The system would have been exactly the same, maybe even worse. That's my point. That they are, I met them in my own youth. I lived in a communist system. I claim it was much more, the most dangerous were the guys who were, how do I put it, honestly patriotic in their corruption. You know where, okay, I will ask you, I will tell you this. That what fascinated me is a specific ethic of corruption, which was like this. This is the implicit logic. It was like this. We know we violate in our work certain basic ethical principles. But isn't this the true ethical greatness? That you are ready for the cause to violate even your basic ethical principles. So, the trick is that you don't experience your act, horrible act, as something corrupted, but as a sign of a much greater ethic. I'm ready to, to, to kill individual flowers for, for the greater cause. You know who put this nicely? Another German guy from the opposite camp, Heinrich Himmler, who said somewhere, every stupid German, almost in this term, is ready to sacrifice his life for Germany. A true great German is ready to sacrifice his soul to do horrible things for Germany. So in this, again, this dimension, this dimension I miss. This is for me the true horror of uh, totalitarianism for me was not this guy sneering, oh, I want to screw your wife, and so on. I knew communist functionaries, and Yugoslavia was not a horrible case. It was relatively open. Well, functionaries were doing horrible things, and then this shocked me. You meet them privately, and you see they're quite nice guys with refined taste. I met, I met secret policemen who enjoyed, I even now think that this is the main proof that God doesn't exist. How can such a horrible guy sincerely like Schoenberg, late Beethoven, drink water, and so on? And I try to convince myself it's a fake. They don't really uh, understand it. No, sorry, they did understand it. You know, which is for me the most depressive fact that I read about Heinrich Heidrich. In the evening, after planning Holocaust and all that stuff, he gathered with three other friends, String quartet, they were playing mostly late Beethoven string quartet. This is something so sacrilegious for me. But let me, I know, here's the time. You know, that's why I almost prefer the other film, which is, I think, in a subtle way, more critical than this one of East Germany, uh, Goodbye Lenin. Because the message of that film is. If you are an honest communist, your own solution is to go crazy, to drop the, you know. It's a, in a subtle way, a, a, a much more, a much more, a much more pessimist, a much more pessimist version. So again, what interests me, this is what I don't trust, again, in that movie. The minister is, for me, the bad guy of the film, too obviously corrupt. What always fascinated me, people who are, they do horrible things. But if you talk to them, they are warm people, they cry when they see a cat mistreated or whatever and so on. Sorry, we cannot go on. Okay, let's take a question from the left side of the stage. I have a uh, proposition and then a question. Um, so in your work, as you say, we are living in the decay of transcendental symmetry. And this is clear Sorry, what do you mean by this? It's too complicated for sure. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, sure, sure, sure. Uh, yes, yes. Well, maybe we can sort of find out from example which I think are gender theory and uh, yeah. ecological politics, but also yeah. historicism, spiritualism, mm -hmm. these sort of things. Um, and what is at work here, I think, is a crisis of what was once called uh, nature philosophy. Um, Sorry, crisis of nature. Nature, nature. Ah, nature philosophy, as in 19th century nature philosophy. Sort of like natural philosophy, like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so we have lost, I think, an orientation towards the coherent structuring of what nature means. And in order to work through this problem, we have to reappropriate the concept currently lost to what is basically uh, sophism. Among these concepts are 
materialism, desire, world, body, whatever. Mm-hmm. And the task is now to see in these concepts the principle of their own contemporary degeneration, thereby returning them to their proper speculative vocation. So my question is this, yes. which is also yeah. sort of on the proposition. Mm-hmm. What do you think the future is for this crisis of nature philosophy, unless you disagree, and what are some possible directions for the future of philosophy? Okay, I will try to be short in straight way, although in a different direction than you. I agree with your problem. I think the tragedy of philosophy, at least the so-called continental philosophy, that is, but now it's moving out with new realism, that is what totally caught in what I call transcendental deconstructionism. It was this purely epistemological reflection, like my old example, sorry if some of you know it. If you were to ask somebody like uh, Michel Foucault, do I have an immortal soul? His answer would have been, uh, I can only describe the episteme, the, the cognitive, uh, the, the space of power and knowledge, within which such a question is meaningful. You, no, you suspend this realist question. You just describe different epistemological configurations and so on and so on. This is, for me, the most radical historicism. Like, you don't answer the question, is the universe finite? The counterpoint would have been simply, but within what philosophical horizon can you even raise this question? And it's interesting how this naive realist questioning then returned in natural sciences, quantum physics, cognitive sciences, and so on. What fascinates me is how today, if you want to know if the universe is finite or infinite, you don't ask philosophers, you ask quantum cosmologists. If you want to know today, do we have a free will or not, you don't ask philosophers, you ask cognitivists and brain scientists, and so on and so on. But it's a difficult question, how should philosophy do it, and what point of nature? I still think that here, for me, the ultimate challenge is my view, the ontological implications of quantum physics. What? It's still an unsolved unresolved question, because I'm sorry if I will now very briefly repeat an old story of mine. I think that the implication of quantum physics is still not perceived. It's something that I can only call unfinished universe, in the sense of ontologically unfinished. We live in a reality which the point is not simply we don't fully know it. The point is, it is in itself not fully constructed. This is an old joke that maybe some of you know it. I read in an introduction to philosophy a wonderful uh, example which tries to clarify quantum physics through the example of, uh, of, of video games. You know, in video games, the universe is not fully constructed. Like, you are shooting somebody in a video game, in the background there is a forest. But if it's not part of the game that you can enter that forest, then that forest is not fully programmed. It's just blurred. Or there is a house on a street. If it's not part of the game that you can enter that house, then the inside of the house is not programmed. So the idea is this one, that this uncertainty principle is more radical than Heisenberg thought. It's not just that we cannot measure particle and uh, particle, its position and velocity, it's that in itself it's open. It doesn't have all these properties. And now comes the beautiful ironic reading. It is as if, if we imagine God as the programmer, God cons- thought that we are more stupid than we are. God thought humans are too stupid to move beyond the limit of atom, so why should I bother programming the inside of an atom? We, as it were, caught God with his hands down. We 
progress into the domain where God was too lazy to fully, okay, but I am, I am an atheist. So my point is how to think this unfinished character of reality. And this has tremendous consequences, beautiful implications, even for, for example, this unfinished character. For example, this is for me authentic multiculturalism. Not we have different cultures, we is, no, I don't, I take my culture, I, I take other cultures, that's not the point. What interests me is this one, here I'm against historicism. One of the most stupid things that you can imagine is the idea that to understand Shakespeare, you must study his epoch and so on and so on. No, Shakespeare didn't understand himself and I think that we, from a certain distance today, we can read into Shakespeare. Shakespeare was like unfinished reality. That's why, and this is for me the authentic multiculturalism. Did you notice that? It surprised me. The best cinema versions of Shakespeare are not English ones. My favorite Shakespeare is Kurosawa from '61, version of Hamlet. The title of the movie is beautiful one. Bad people sleep well. Set in contemporary Japan, a, a rich Japanese student returns from the United States. His father is killed. Uh, and, but but the point is that how you know this is not just that we expand. It's as if through this distance or whatever. The best uh, Kurosawa also did the best version of Dostoevsky that I know. Idiot. Set in Japan, forty-eight, Hakuichi, and so on. I like this idea. That's why, incidentally, I'm against identity politics, because there are no identities. To understand Shakespeare, you don't have to study England. You can precisely to forget about this context. I'm more and more convinced that to understand really a work of art, you should not know too much about its context. So, I know I didn't answer your question. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> But okay. what I would have said is that I admit your topic, return to philosophy of nature, what does it mean, materialism, body today, but I think that the answers are not the answers we were used to in the 19th century and so on and so on. So that we have to radically rethink things. Uh, Professor Zizek, uh, so you've just given this answer to quantum. I've never heard the response to Francois Laurel's non-standard philosophy. Of course, you have your response to Graham Harman. Well, uh, uh, well, you have your response to flat ontologies of Graham Harman and Lacour, but, uh, you know, this uh, vision in one that Laurel calls the observation effect that the real is epistemically disclosed to us, but the quantum allows us that our observation affects the real. Um, you know, I mean, my question was going to be about Jacques Alain Miller, and uh, you'd be more of a Millerian than a Lacanian. But after hearing your response to this quantum question, how do you how do you contend with Laurelian non-standard philosophy? Because it's not you can't do the same. If you want to, you know, use quantum as this kind of theoretical fulcrum, then you have to sort of back off from your the transcendental decision. But Hegelians like uh, Catherine Malibu and yourself still hold on to the transcendental decision. So there seems to be this hot line between a quantum and the transcendental, because if we allow for, you know... Uh, it's a ahead. beautiful question, but again, my God, you put me in an impossible position, because it's a, it's a, well, it's a, it's a two-hour answer, at least. <laughs> I, I cannot do it. What I would have said is that I would just have been here much more... Uh, I would have been much more careful here, my position is, that's why the title of one of my books, if you go into philosophy, is this absolute recoil and so on, is that, uh, and I don't, I don't even, I don't want to go into it, I will just tell you a brief anecdote and then I stop. Uh, 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 what do we mean by, trans you know, this is the eternal problem that I also get whenever I visit Korea and so on, for, that I misunderstand Buddhism and so on and so on. My answer is uh, that uh, Buddhism is great thing and so on to abstract from the fact that Buddhism can be the best justification you can imagine for war crimes and so on. But that's another story. But, you know, my position is this one, and that's what I 
were aimed at when I mentioned that falling in love and so on. We have a simplified to the utmost. Philosophy which see reality as a mess, chaos, difference, and then you somehow withdraw from it and find inner peace. Like, you see it all this distance, blessing. No! My point is that proof is the fall itself. I want to celebrate the fall. The event is the fall, even in the most radical ontological sense. And my point is that it's only through the fall that that what the fall is fall from emerges. Let me give you the stop here. Uh, 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 the, the most vulgar example which I use maybe even in this room already. Years ago, I flirted uh, years ago with a lady who probably to seduce me told me that uh, when her last lover saw her naked, he told her that except for three, four pounds to mark, her body is perfect. I told her, just don't lose three, four pounds. Because, you know, it's this subtle paradox. You need something to disturb perfection so that retroactively the mirage of perfection emerges. If you get rid of the obstacle, you also lose the perfection which was disturbed by the obstacle. So that would have been my my ontology. I celebrate diversity. I celebrate the fall. That's why I'm an atheist Christian. For me, what happens in Christianity is we don't rejoin God. God rejoins us. God speaks with himself. You know what happens on the cross when Christ says, Father, Father, why have you abandoned me? me? It means, as Gilbert Keith Chester, my favorite Catholic theologist, put it, it means God himself is for a brief moment an atheist. I want to celebrate Paul. What I like about love is not that uh, I love you all. Fuck you, I don't love you all. I love one and all of you can go to hell, others. I want to celebrate division, one-sidedness, imbalance, and so on. That's my ontology, okay. but I cannot go now, sorry, into okay. what this means. Yes. <laughs> Hello, Doctor. I want to ask a question about Hong Kong. So many journalists have been saying that the movement is increasingly nationalist. It is to counteract the Chinese imperialism, as they perceive. Hmm? I wonder if you share this angle, and do we approach this unique nationalism by situating it in the global revival of right-wing nationalism? Uh, first, uh, I must say I'm not trying to squeeze out of it that uh, sympathetic as I am towards the protest movement, from what I can tell you is that first, I am not, as some people accuse me, a conformist here. From what I know, some of you maybe know more about me in China than I do. I only know that about a year ago I was informed that because I signed some letter of protest apropos the previous demonstrations there, and I signed the letter in defense of the most interesting thing now happening. I get information from friends there, uh, you know, now, Marxism is there officially again in there, reprinting, distributing to students, Mao, Marx, uh, Lenin. But it's better for you, I'm told, not to read this text. Because some of my friends there then try to follow Marx very naively, got connected with workers who are poisoned, and then they were arrested. And so my point is that my book disappeared from bookstores. Then, now they are half back, I was told, but at the same time, at, at the same time, students are afraid to quote me in their thesis, so my status is there in between. So, of course, I'm sympathetic to demonstrations and so on and so on. The only thought, you know, China is for me a mega problem, a mega tragedy. Look, I told this to Kuhu, sorry that I was there, Jordan Peterson. <laughs> Namely, what I told you. Listen, when people say, oh, communism screwed up everything possible, I said, sorry, was there ever in the history of humanity more explosive economic development 
than in the last 40 years in China. So many people lifted out of poverty and so on. And that's the lesson for us Western lefties. We, in the 20th century, we say that we hate the two things. White, unbridled capitalist competition and strong authoritarian state. How the Chinese did it precisely by combining these two? You know? So, I'm not glad about this. I'm not, and uh, so, it's such a, uh, what, what I just don't like, that's my only point of, I wouldn't say sympathy, but suspicion about China. You know, it's so easy to criticize China for something we are doing here in a little bit more subtle way. For example, you know, we all know those stories which are true, incidentally. How in China we have that, how do you call this patriotic uh, status or whatever, each of the citizens gets a point, if you say that, if you are a dissident, you lose points, all that stuff. Yeah, but we are all also doing it just in a more, you know, uh, just in a more subtle, in a more subtle way, and so on, and so on. I think that we often use China, again, in a way to acquire safe distance towards something that we are also approaching to, and so on. So, in this sense, I don't have any problems criticizing things in China. My pessimism is just this one. Uh, you know, maybe you know this story. I, I cannot tell you a guy who told it may, may bring him brought into trouble. A uh, high-ranking Chinese philosopher told me that he knew the daughter of Deng Xiaoping. And he told him that when Deng Xiaoping was dying, some high functionaries visited him and asked him to kiss his ass, of course. You said, uh, what was the greatest thing you did? They thought the answer will be uh, opening up reforms. He said, no, that I resisted the temptation to go all the way and liberalize politics also. The tragedy is that it's horrible. I'm not glad to say this, but what if he was right? I think that at that point, after Tiananmen or before, to simply opt for political pluralism, I think it wouldn't end well. What does this mean? It's, uh, I, I don't believe in this naive liberal vision. So what should we do? Should China be our model? No, absolutely not. But what do we have as, a, as an alternative? And so on and so on. So yes, I will protest always, sign protest for those in Hong Kong. Although, of course, I was shocked when some of them then called Trump save us from China and so on. <laughs> Wait a minute, be serious and so on. No, all right, all right. No, what I'm, what I'm just saying is that it's not China as such that bothers me. It's that what bothers us in China, let's rather focus on ourselves and see where we are doing basically the same thing, just in more subtle ways. I was interested in knowing how um, your talk will, or what you said in the talk has an impact on notions of uh, emancipation and uh, empowerment, essentially. You mentioned how um, the empowered liberal movement in a liberal democratic order will um, herself, based on her position or based on the empowerment that she has gained, will um, be used to, or essentially will be, a, will herself become a part of and um, creating new forms of oppression, the uh, benevolent form of um, yes. um, um, oppression that is yes. um, emblematic of the new order. So um, there seems to be this tension between this idea of um, empowerment within the order and emancipation beyond it. But that is tricky because where does that sense of emancipation lie? How do you differentiate between these two things? It's a, it's a crucial question, but what I want to avoid is uh, to keep these two aspects too much apart, because then you, I don't want to get stuck into this option of either you are just a pragmatist and do small measures which change nothing, or you wait for the big event. I here remain a kind of a dialectical thinker where I think that often truly radical changes can be triggered by what appears just a small 
reform in the system. That's the lesson for me, at least from the disintegration of the communist regime, and so on and so on. Sometimes the right thing to do is just to insist on small measures which can appear totally pragmatic, it doesn't mean anything, and, but it triggers, it, triggers, uh, it triggers the big process. I don't believe in, again, waiting for the big moment, radical change, and so on and so on. I, 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 I believe in this weird combination of, how to put it, pragmatic politics, but when you make pragmatic choices, which then trigger much more radical choices. I know I didn't quite properly answer you, but that's my ideal, that's my ideal politics. That's why, for example, that's why I still believe, up to a point in, take Bernie Sanders. Radical leftists are right to say, my God, but if you look closely at his program, it's much less radical than so European social democracy, mainstream social democracy was half a century ago. Yes, but in today's situation, to say what was commonly accepted 50 years ago is something which can lead further and so on and so on. You know, we live in paradoxical times where uh, very modest demand can be much more explosive than apparent radical demand. I say pseudo-radicals, those who demand radical action, but are fully aware that this means absolutely nothing. You just sit comfortably and criticize every, everybody else as being a compromiser and so on and so on. How do you think the rise of tech like AI and uh, machine learning and 5G and essentially a um, uh, technological singularity will reshape ideology in the next 25 years? Uh, this is a beautiful question. I'm now writing a book on it. First, I don't think it's uh, artificial intelligence as such, which is what fascinates me is there are different names, Neuralink, Wired Brain, and so on. Because it basically means, to put it in very simple theoretical terms, till now, in our dealing with the digital universe, we needed an interface. If the idea of wired brain, in the sense of uh, our brain directly, our line of thought directly connected with digital universe directly, then this changes everything. This means that our brain is already an interface, directly. And I think this changes everything, radically. Uh, it's a good question that you ask, what remains not only of ideology, but of the whole, how to put it, mm, universe of rhetoric, of mediation, and so on. The basic feature of human universe, for me, is that things succeed through failure. You try to do something, you fail, something else emerges, and even the whole point of eroticism is this. It's a systematized failure and so on. In your, so, in your book, have you put study to uh, the potential like reaching a technological singularity and how that would kind of... Well, a first singularity is not like a problem. Around. If you mean singularity in the sense of Ray Kurzweil and others and so on, I, for reasons that I cannot explain now, I think it cannot happen in the sense in which it is imagined, because I think that, that uh, I think that, you know what bothers me when I read Kurzweil and so on? He describes this unit, he somehow presupposes that although we will share intelligence, share awareness with others and so on and so on, that Somehow we will still think and act in the same way we do now. But take just sexuality. I cannot imagine in what sense sexuality, the way we know it now, can survive in a universe where we can directly share our experiences. Our sexuality, through all the acts of seduction, flirting, and so on, is absolutely rooted in our finitude, in our uncertainty, what, what do you want, 
the ambiguity of answer and so on and so on. Let's say we, and I don't want to be prosecuted as character later, so any of you, let's say we are flirting. Uh, imagine we have a wired brain. There is no flirting. Our mind just directly, I want to fuck you, yes, okay, let's do it, or whatever. It's over in a split, er- eroticism is over. I, th- I think that the situation in the wired brain will be something that uh, precisely what I described with that lady of uh, 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 for finds too much or whatever. We will get the thing itself, but immediate contact spiritual with another, but we will lose the obstacle. Because all the entire human spirit, the way I see it, is based on imperfection. You, let me give you the last example. Okay, sorry, I'm losing time. Uh, this I may be used even in this room. I, did you see the movie Billy Bathgate, Nicole Kidman, Dustin Hoffman, and so on. It's based on Doctor of Novel, and I didn't like the movie, but it looked to me that I saw in it the traces of a great novel, like it needs to capture the spirit of the great novel. Okay, then I said, let's read the novel. I'm sorry that I say this, the novel was even worse for me. So, you, we have a bad novel, I think so. I apologize if you don't. Bad novel, bad movie, but in between a specter of a perfect novel or whatever emerges. And that's for what I don't see place in this, in, in singularity. How? Through repeated failures, through two failures, you repeat a failure and a specter of a perfect entity emerges. You take away the failures, you lose the perfection itself. I'm sorry. Mm. I can go on, but uh, I think there is another event of Acer. Yes. Yes, I am. You know what I say? False leftists, when they get tired of debate, they always mention it so hypocritical. They say we would like to go on, but the poor cleaning ladies who are waiting to clean the room, you know. It's just they are too lazy to go on. Yes. So I hope this 8.30 event is not a new version of those cleaning plays. <laughs> yes. um, I was wondering if you could, if I could get your opinion on the discourse and ideology surrounding the Joker movie that just came out but and the figure of incels so in popular culture. Um, if I could get your opinion on the discourse surrounding the Joker movie and incels. I, I will tell you something horrible. I break the law all the time. I only watch pirated movies, and I didn't yet find a good pirate uh, <laughs> coffee and so on. But let me tell you something that may surprise you. This Wednesday, in two days, I will participate at a, at a, in, at a debate on superheroes at Princeton, and there I want, I want to go into it because, uh, uh, of course, in some sense, the Joker we all love is, of course, from uh, the second of this Nolan trilogy, Batman movies, and so on and so on. Uh, I wonder to what extent am I reading the movie against the grain that the Joker, he just wants the mask to fall. He is, for me, in some sense, not a bad guy, but an authentic hero. And I wonder to what extent these movies play what I call Leo Strauss game. You know, Leo Strauss read Plato in this way, that although Plato in some dialogue officially celebrates the good guy, but really between the lines, it's the game already played by John Milton. It's clear that he's on the side of, of, of the safety, you know. Although, officially not. And, of course, the way, the only way to redeem Black Panther, for me, is the same. How is the guy called who loses, who dies at the end? Killmonger. Isn't it absolutely clear that, and the movie makes it in some way even almost explicit, yes, that he is the authentic hero? Can it be more clear than you remember how, at the end, when the good king, 
make a speech at United Nations, who is at his side benevolently smiling? The CIA agent and so on. It's like, fuck your this new black king, kingdom, authentic but protected by CIA, as they make it clear. So in the same sense, and I even, I go very far here. Not only this, so I will walk the movie this with all my sympathy for Joker. I think Joker should be very rehabilitated. I go to the end here, which is the first part of Christopher Nolan trilogy, Dark Knight Returns or whatever. Sorry? Yes. Where, who is there the bad guy? That Kane or what? Yes. He is the, good, he is the revolutionary. The movie is for me about socialist republic of Manhattan. This goes on. I mean, I, of course, there are all the compromises, and, and I even proposed to, uh, to some guys that I accidentally, I don't have connections there, made in Hollywood. Now, this will shock you, it will be too much for you. Uh, uh, to do a new version of Star Wars, rehabilitating the uh, Emperor and Darth Vader as the progressive authoritarian leaders fighting uh, reactionary feudals like Jedi and so on and so on. You know, it's kind of, it, uh, I always like to, and I think this is maybe in today's desperate times, Hollywood, I wouldn't say at its best, but it is most interesting, where it pursues a certain vision, but it is, that's my vision of Christopher Nolan. Of course, the official ideology of Dark Knight Rises is even explicitly all the references to Charles Dickens and so on, the novel, etc. But he is honest enough to bring out these ambiguities, inconsistencies, and so on and so on. Mm -hmm. So I'm just looking, but, but uh, if you want interesting movies today, you know which one I like? Did you see it? Is it the right title? A modern science fiction movie which passed more or less unnoticed with John Goodman called Captive State. Can you see? Okay, let's okay. 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 it now. We don't uh, uh, Apologies to those who stood in line throughout the Q&A, but uh, that's all the time we have. Jimmy? Yes. Thank you very much. I'm grateful to you. One you know last, uh, I, no, that's something very, not another story. That, uh, you know, publishers are telling me, I hated them years ago, why don't you write a book on Donald Trump and so on? We need psychoanalysis to understand this madman. No, my answer was, uh, Trump is pretty transparent what he's doing. We only need psychoanalysis to understand the stupidity of Democrats who made his election Trump possible, you know. So what I'm saying is that don't lose trust into philosophy and events like this or the fact that, for example, publishers almost dropped me for my big fat book, uh, Less Than Nothing. They thought, who will buy it? That book, 1,000 pages on Hegel, is standing better than many of my short uh, uh, political books. And I'm really proud of that, of you. It's not true, this propaganda today, there is no intellectual movement, people no longer read. No, there are still people who read theory, and they are our only hope, I think. Yeah. Thank you very much.